Hey everyone, Ivy League Gaming here, and today we're playing Watcher of Realms. For today's video, I'm going to be on the test server taking a proper look at the new Chaos Dominion faction that's arriving to the global servers. So first of all, I guess we should kind of talk about why this is um, as relevant as it is, right? So in our notices, you probably saw here, we have an ancient summoning event. This is our first one for the global servers. And along with that, well, we kind of get an increased chance to get lords. And this is the only way that the Chaos Dominion faction can be summoned. So there's a whole faction that's exclusive to the ancient summoning crystals. So that's pretty cool. I think it makes it more unique. It's fun. And they're a quirky faction that's kind of designed for PvP that are really designed for arena. But they probably have some fun uses elsewhere. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, I'll quickly show this infographic here that you probably already noticed. But we're going to take a look at the characters actually in game um, and really spin them, give them a spin, take a look at their skills and discuss where they should be great for content. So faction ability, members of this faction can deal great damage at low HP. I did already put a video out on different factions and the lords that go along with them. And we did briefly touch on this one. So this one is all about kind of a frenzy, chaotic uh, theme, of course, where the lower their HP, the more damage they're going to do, which is a little bit risky in some content. But for stuff like Arena, where you're relying a lot on RNG at times, I mean, that can be really strong for high levels of Arena. So we have a ton of great heroes added to the mix that all look really cool. So I can't wait to show them off better. There is five star lord gone who's very good and then we have um cost reduction effects as well as part of their traits which makes them quicker and easier to place for arena and we have damage increases as well for their passives we have um attributes enhanced like always for the lords but yeah we're gonna take a look so this faction here um the dps heroes sacrifice a percentage of hp and perform ultimate skills to do massive burst damage defensive heroes improve the survivability of the team and healers heal heroes at low hp so this is just really geared for arena at the end of the day um this is kind of what their focus is and i think that's cool it's nice to have heroes that can be niche but really excel in specific areas of the game so let's actually go back here to the faction. So we have um, the Lord skills. We have Gon as the legendary Lord and Valdov as the four star um, epic Lord here. So increases all, of course, the faction ally attribute bonus that both of them have 15 for the legendary and 10 for the epic. And then also increases faction allies damage based on their their lost hp percentage up to 40 percent at 30 percent hp and for him we have up to 60 percent at 30 percent hp plus we've gone here um faction allies gain a 20 percent attack and defense bonus when their hp is below 30 percent so if you want to use them somewhere a bit tougher like maybe guild boss defense is actually pretty key for guild boss survivability in long runs so this bonus here is going to help keep them alive when they're struggling after a couple hard hits from guild boss if you have this legendary lord it might be something fun to try but again this is a faction that's geared toward arena all right so first up we have gone this is the legendary lord as we've mentioned and well he's pretty darn good Luckily for him, uh, he is an overall defender. He's kind of universal. I really think you can use him even if you're not just focusing on the Chaos Dominion for Arena. You can certainly use him just as a defender in general content wherever you need one. He also can put out some damage, so you might be able to build him as a DPS uh, slightly at least. So we have ultimate increases block by three. 
and grants physical damage reduction and magic damage reduction to all allies. This effect lasts for 10 seconds. Really great protection for the allies, a true defender. His uh, basic attack attacks up to three enemies in range, dealing 70% damage to each enemy. Uh, his passive taking damage has 15% chance to attack up to 10 enemies ahead, dealing 300% AoE damage. So we've got some AoE damage possibilities as well. Um, passive here triggers when HP drops below 30%. If the hero takes damage below 25% max HP, the damage will be reduced to 10. This effect lasts for 10 seconds. Just more protection and damage reduction. He also has the arena cost reduction skill, like we mentioned regarding the two lords. So his cost when being placed in arena is only 14, which is wonderful. And then of course, yeah, he is the lord. He has the lord bonuses. His awakenings are also really solid. We have uh, insensibility here. The cooldown is reduced by 20 seconds. Really nice. It's a long cooldown. So we have Awaken 2 is, of course, like the rest of the legendary lords, add some bonuses to the faction overall. Uh, faction allies damage is increased by 5%. His Awaken 3, the effective battle cry ends. The next basic attack triggers frantic retribution instead dealing 1,000% AoE damage um, to a maximum of 10 enemies ahead. The AoE damage is based on the number of times the hero receives damage during Battle Cry. So that's another quirky one. I really like that. It sounds like he definitely has some damage potential. And then all damage reduction for his Awaken 4 and Awaken 5 gains bonus range. So if you can get him Awaken 3, it sounds like he might be worth building as a DPS. But maybe if we're not talking about Awaken 3, I mean, that's pretty hard to do for a Legendary Lord. Maybe you just stick to using him as a proper tank, as he is a very versatile tank that could be used in most situations. Of course, like we've said, Chaos is all about Arena, but they can be used, some of them at least, in other scenarios. But he's a pretty strong Lord, so you'd be happy if you pulled him and can definitely be maxed out and be used as a normal defender. Here is our Legendary Lord. Uh, he's got some really great base stats, honestly. Pretty darn tanky. Should be very easy to keep alive. So next up we have Vladov. He is the Epic Lord. So just like the Legendary one, he also has the reduction in hero cost by 5 for Arena. So placing him is only 13 for cost. Really low cost. Really great. He does have a bleed as well. So this is someone you could use in Guild Boss if you're not lucky enough to have a Salazar. So his basic attack deals 75% damage to one enemy two times with each attack. His ultimate, when activated, transforms 12% of max HP to attack. Meanwhile, loses HP by 10% of current HP per second when eliminating a target, but recovers 7% HP. The skill lasts for 15 seconds. So this might be a little bit hard in Guild Boss to keep him alive, but I guess you're going to have some strong healing, hopefully anyway. So that shouldn't be too much of an issue, but for Arena, uh, he kind of has this quirky skill here. So he'd be great for some of the arenas where you're killing multiple enemies and he actually can kind of life steal and get his, his health back after he kills an enemy. All right, we also have this passive here, 20% chance triggered by attacks, dealing 150% AoE damage up to five targets in front semicircle area and apply bleed effect on the target. So we have a bleed with the passive. I forgot to give him a proper spin. He looks pretty cool. I really like his aesthetic. All right, and then we have, of course, he is a lord, so he has the epic lord bonuses. His awakenings, awakening one, basic attacks have a 10% chance to apply bleed effect on the targets. So you're definitely gonna wanna use one of those awakening stones on him if you don't get a dupe, because that's a pretty strong addition, especially if you're gonna use him in something like guild boss where bleed can be really helpful. Even Artifact Material Raid, he can probably be pretty strong for. Now, I wouldn't say he is a top-tier fighter to choose compared to some of the others, but you're probably going to use Deimos over him for most of those situations. But hey, at least he does pair with the Nightmare faction as well, so you can actually take advantage of the bonus there. And he does have a talent that increases attack speed by 30 for 8 seconds each time he takes damage. 
So again, he really does pair great with the, the Nightmare Faction if you're going to use him in Guild Boss. And here are the base stats for our Epic Lord. Pretty low attack, especially if you compare him to the Legendary afterward, honestly. Next up, we have Lugaru. He is probably one of the stronger units from this faction. Aesthetically, he's gorgeous. Look at that sword, too. Really cool. Dripping blood randomly. He's got a really good aesthetic. Another badass werewolf. I love it. So he is a fighter who also pairs with the Nightmare Faction. So yet again, someone that's going to be pretty strong with the other lords as well, even if you don't have the Chaotic Lord. So that's really nice to see. So they're, he's, of course, going to be great for Arena. Um, probably more like the sustain arena, I would say. His talent, um, every 12 seconds, the hero consumes 20% of current HP to trigger a lethal strike one time, dealing 180% damage. When HP is below 50%, the damage increases by 60%. So he gets a big damage boost when he's at low HP, just like a lot of these chaos heroes. So his basic attack deals 100% damage to one enemy with a 15% chance of inflicting bleed on the target. That's really good to see as well. Like, we love bleed. Bleed is really strong for bosses like the guild boss or even just in artifact material raid, which are probably his strongest suits, I would say. He is going to be a great hero for your team, especially if you can get a Scarlet Hunt to go with that bleed for your artifact. So his ultimate here reduces the cooldown of Lethal Strike by 7 seconds. Additionally, Lethal Strike ignores 30% of defense to targets with bleed. There you go. All about the bleed. So even if he's not the only one with bleed, if you have someone else with bleed as well in the team, that can be really beneficial to make sure that that debuff is always up so everyone can take advantage of it, whether it be him ignoring 30% defense or if you have Scarlet Hot accessories, on some of your fighters, you're really going to want bleed to always be on the target. So passive prayer here, thirst for blood. Every 1% of max HP lost increases attack speed by 1, up to 50, and then even more with the levels. So passive feral fury, when deployed, deducts 40% of the hero's current HP immediately and increases 4% of attack permanently. Increases attack one time every 25 seconds after that, up to 16%. So keep in mind, he self-sacrifices at the start of being deployed. So you're definitely going to want to place him when there's already a healer around or you're about to place a healer right afterward. He's not going to survive very long without it. Uh, unfortunately, it's not like he has a ton of self-sustain himself. He, he's still totally worth it. He seems like a very strong fighter. And you can probably use him most anywhere you need a fighter. He's another good universal strong hero. Anywhere you need a fighter, he's going to be great for. But you're going to want a good healer to kind of make up for the fact that he self-sacrifices in general. Although it's still going to be fine for Arena. The way that these guys work together, the synergy is just really, really strong if you're focusing a Chaos Dominion team for Arena. Um, we have an increased damage in Arena by 15% as well with a passive, so even better. He also has two blocks of range in front of him, which is really nice because then you could put a defender directly in front of him and he can still attack in the tile ahead and do damage and help protect that defender as well as just, yeah, help clear a whole roll. I love that. It's such a big skill. I forgot. Let me show the base stats here. Pretty strong. Nice big ol' attack. I like it. All right, next up we have Dasomi. Dasomi is a healer and, um, I guess, support hero more so than even a healer. He does his magic incense. If the bearer's HP is higher than 50%, dispels one debuff every two seconds. Otherwise, restores their HP based on their max HP and the caster's attack every two seconds. So there's a little bit of a heal based on attack. Um, but really, I think the cleanse is the main role for Dasomi. We don't have a ton of content right now where you need to worry about cleansing all the time. So that could change depending on what new content comes out. Or things like Void Rift, where if you have to cleanse um, some sort of debuff. But having the cleanse of a dispel of a debuff is really helpful in 
some areas. It's just a little bit niche, so I wouldn't say he's going to be the most useful overall. His basic attack grants magic incense upon one ally in range. His ultimate uh, can heal two more allied units and grant them magic incense, increasing their defense by 20%. So he does give a little bit of survivability to the rest of the team, but it's only, well, not to the rest of the team, it's only to two more. So it's not like a full AoE heal or buff or, yeah, applying this special magic incense. Uh, Guardian Fume here grants one shield to one ally in range with HP below 25% for 10 seconds. The shield value is equal to 60% of the target's max HP. So this is one of those hard ones too. Like whenever it's the target's max HP, it's not quite as good as like a strong HP based unit providing a shield where it's based on their HP, of course. If you're putting a shield on a squishy attack-based nuker, they're not going to have a ton of max HP, more than likely, so the shield is not going to be that big. But an extra shield is always helpful, so it's definitely a decent support skill, but probably not going to be too impactful as a shield itself. All right, the passive here, after entering the field, increases attack by 5% every 25 seconds, uh, stacking up to three times. So this is nice, but it's kind of confusing. I guess the good thing here increases attack by 5% every 25 seconds. He's going to make his um, heals be better. He also has a reduced cost in arena by 5. So placing him in arena to help support the team, he's going to be only 13 as a cost. Pretty good, actually. He's got a decent range, um, a wide range for his heal. Does provide a little bit of continuous healing, if you consider that, like it says here, with the magic incense. And that cleanse is going to be useful. He is also part of the Isoterrorist uh, faction here. Isoteria Order, uh, which is with all the other lizards. So that's not a surprise. But yeah, he has a quirky kit and it sounds like it could be good. I just don't know that we um, need as many cleansers right now for most content. But he'll probably excel in some of those areas where you do. I like the sound of him, but I'm not quite sure he's super useful right now. It might be a little bit niche. Uh, his awakenings here, when triggered, Guardian Fume has 30% chance to take a cooldown of 10 seconds. Second one increases his attack. Third one on the field increases healing effects for all allies by 10%. That might help to give him a little bit more extra utility as a healer but it's going to be pretty hard to get his awakenings up as a Chaos Dominion hero. Um, but let's look. His Awaken 5 increases the healing multiplier of Magic Incense applied during the effect by tw by 50%. Who by 50? That's really nice. So yeah, this is where, like, if you get him fully awakened, he's probably going to be a pretty good healer, not just uh, focus on the cleanse, the dispel of a debuff. Um, but lower levels, I'm not quite sure he's going to be a top tier, top tier healer choice so valeria here actually is just now getting a change a rework on the forerunner server actually just verified that the changes coming to the forerunner server are already changed here as i'm looking at her on the test server so we have the proper stats to show you but and look at her look at that sword it's gorgeous amazing graphics with this hero Really, really love it. But all right, let's continue taking a look at her kit. So 100% damage to one enemy with a basic attack. Simple enough. Uh, her ultimate damage plus 80%. Each attack consumes 10% of the current HP and generates one stack of the power of the sword, up to eight stacks. The hero cannot be healed during the skill. When the skill ends, deals 400% burst damage to the main target and four targets around them. Interesting. So the power of the sword burst damage to the main target increases by 50% with each stack after the skill ends. Sounds like it has some great damage potential, and I'm really glad to see they did a little bit of a rework here. Um, so maybe this is going to help give her a little bit more damage output. I think when I had originally looked her up, she was kind of noted to not have as great of damage output and not be and not be too top tier but hopefully the buffs to her improve that so she is being changed for you forerunner server players there is an update coming so this is the actual update all right so auto here plunging slash smashes the target enemy dealing 240 percent damage inflicting vulnerability 
During the ultimate, each attack reduces plunging Slash's cooldown by 2 seconds. When HP drops below 30%, restores 2% per second. Triggers the following effect instead during the ultimate. The hero enters unyielding stay upon taking fatal damage and dies immediately when the ultimate ends, which can be triggered up to one time per deployment. Unyielding can really come in handy in so many situations. That's pretty strong, actually. So I'm really curious to see how she's going to be um, with these little bits of adjustments and what the people that have already used her on something like the Forerunner servers will think with her updates. So she do again, she does have some updates and she's a bit a bit changed from Forerunner to what I have on the test server. Also, she does have the Nightmare Faction synergy as well. Again, nice to see that they're kind of synergizing. And here we go with the base stats, decent base attack as well. Okay, survivability. Pretty cool though, I like her. Her Awakening one all during the ultimate increases attack speed by 100. Attack 5%. During the ultimate ignores 20% of the enemy's defense. Crit rate up by 8%. And her Awaken 5 during the ultimate, there's a 50% chance to accumulate two stacks of power of the sword for each attack, up to 12 stacks in total. So I feel like... I feel like she sounds like she has great potential, but maybe she wasn't quite living up to that potential damage-wise, so that's why they gave her a little bit of a buff. Alright, we have Cerebus now. This is a quirky character. So he's cultist and chaotic, so that's fun to have. Again, another synergy with another faction. So he's a sacrificial warrior. So this can be quirky. Not everybody likes those kind of kits and it can be hard to time and I have heard wonderful things about him. I'm pretty sure my bucket has um, quite a good opinion of this character. I've heard it mentioned a lot. So the talent summons Water of Decay at the location of the enemy with the highest HP at the cost of 20% of max HP every 14 seconds. Inflicts 30% AoE damage every second for 6 seconds. Whenever this hero takes damage, the cooldown is reduced by 2 seconds. This hero cannot be healed or revived by allies, and each death extends the revival time by 30 seconds. Really interesting though, I think, I think it's like one of those things where it's a complicated kit, but once you master it and figure out how it synergizes with its other teammates, you could probably really take advantage. All right, so they do know here basic attack defender protection. And again, all of them are great for arena. So let's read through his skills. When, uh, basic attack is magic attack. When deployed, it immediately deals 200% AoE damage to surrounding enemies and then creates water of decay beneath the hero's feet, dealing 40% AoE damage to multiple enemy units per second. This effect lasts permanently. Sounds really solid for a basic attack really solid that it goes along with the talent here super interesting i love it i love how his kit sounds there you go you can kind of see the visual up here so the ultimate during the ultimate increases damage by 70 percent additionally each instance of damage dealt will inflict uh 50 percent slow on the target for 15 seconds all right we've got some crowd control in the mix as well i like to hear that and we have a passive upon death generates a ground area effect underneath dealing 100% AOE damage per second for 12 seconds. So even when he dies, he's going to do extra like burst damage. So if he's going to, you could try to literally time his death if that's possible. I know that sounds quirky, but you could purposefully not heal him after dealing his ultimate. And you can probably do some really fun stuff. So this is, all right. Reducing the hero's first deployment cost by six. That's part of this passive. Upon his first death, reduces the next deployment cost for every allied mage by one. So he actually helps to make the rest of the mages in your team deploy cheaper. That's really random, but hey, I like it. And his cost in arena reduced by two. This could be really strong for like the AoE arena, the um, just in gear raid one, I'm sure as well. Slow is great. AoE damage immediately with this basic attack. Sounds like there's a massive potential for this hero. There you go. Another solid 6,000 attack. Seems pretty consistent with a lot of these. 
an okay survivability. Seems pretty cool to me. His Awakening 1, within 10 seconds of deployment, all ground area effects will slow enemies in range. 2, we've got an end attack percent increase. 3, when HP drops below 50%, doubles the damage dealt by the ground area effect per second. Very good. Increased crit rate with 4 and 5. Reduces the cooldown of talent effect by 3 seconds and the HP consumption by 5% max HP. All right. A really interesting hero. Certainly one I'm curious about. All right. We have Cade as well here. He also pairs with the Isoteric uh, faction, the Isotericist. Isotericist. Uh, <laughs> Isoteria Order. They have too many names for their factions. All right. Let's go through Cade a little bit quicker. I'm going to try to speed up. There's so much to talk about still. So Cade is a magic hero, burst damage, and has a summon. So the talent here, Windbreak, Stormbeak, Windbeak, Stormbeak, Spiritbeak, have 20% chance to grant the hero winged blessings before disappearing. So winged blessings, um, during the different stances, there's different buffs. Increases attack by 20%, enhances attacks to into storm attacks for 15 seconds, and then increases attack speed by 30 until the end of the battle. Up to 20%. His basic attack summons Windbeak to deal 100% damage that will bounce to one extra enemy. Gal's Sacrifice marks one target enemy for six seconds, inflicting ma uh, magic damage vulnerability, causing all heroes to prioritize attacking them. When any mark is active, the hero loses 10% of his current HP per second. Additionally, if any marked enemy dies, the hero will sacrifice themselves to summon Stormbeak that lasts for 16 seconds. So, I'm not sure I'm too fond of the way this character sounds. He's just... Like, what if he... If, okay, he marks one hero, but what if, like, something else is coming behind them? Or, like, the boss is about to pop out and he marks someone you don't want him to mark, so to speak? I don't know. It's kind of quirky, and I don't, I think it might be hard to make work on, like, full auto stuff. Of course, you can time things manually, but you can't always guarantee that if there's multiple units in range, the effect is going to land on the exact one you want it to, right? Marks one target. You can't tell him to mark one specific target if there's four targets in the radius, right? So I don't know. This sounds a little bit too quirky for me. Summon Spirit Beak upon the death of a tree of allies. And then again, Spirit Beak is the attack speed of all allies and range increases. So it does sound like he has some cool buffs for the allies around him. I like that. His other passive, when the hero dies or retreats, deals 40% magic damage to one enemy within range 45 times. Okay, that sounds really interesting. 40, but only 40%, it's not crazy, but 45 times. So I guess you could probably do some quirky stuff with him. I keep saying the word quirky. I feel like that defines this faction. Am I right? The chaos faction is quirky. Um, but if you purposefully retreat him at the right times, when there's only one enemy out that you're trying to get rid of, you can, they'll blast with 45 hits. Is that right? That doesn't sound right, but okay, that's crazy. Arena, um, 45. Is that really right? It has to be. Look at the extra bonuses. Oh my gosh. Anyway, arena cost reduces, um, sorry, reduced five as well for him in arena. This is a really interesting kit. I can't tell if it has amazing potential or it's just too weird. But it's <laughs> Awakening 1, revival time minus 10 seconds. Always great, especially with the way his, um, you kind of can take advantage of the, yeah, letting him die or recalling him. All right, Awaken 3 after Ethereal Blessing is triggered increases the effect duration by 5%. Okay. Rage Regen with the 4th and 5th. When Stormbeak is summoned by Galactic Sacrifice, there's a 30% chance to summon one extra copy of Stormbeak. He, yeah, he is definitely a quirky one. I, I just feel like quirky is seriously the best way to describe this faction. But there you go. There is the main stats for this hero. All right, next up we have Sargok. So the ruthless orc general whose violent nature has led him to slay friends and foes alike. 
Some of their descriptions are really fun. Another really cool character design. Really cool orc. Love it. Amazing graphics again. And then physical attack deals 100% damage to one enemy, enemy prioritizing airborne units. When triggered, Bloodshed Fury, the ultimate, reduces 10% of current HP per second, reduces defense by 30%, and increases attack by 20%. Additionally, each basic attack lands two consecutive strikes. So he's got a lot of sacrifice going on there, but then he does a ton of damage. So you got to be ready to heal him afterward or maybe recall him if things are about to get messy, but it definitely boosts his damage. So his passive here increases attack speed by six for every 1% HP lost. The effect is specialized attack speed is stronger when HP is lowered. Provides greater reduction in attack interval based on attack speed attributes. So attack speed? <laughs> I don't, it's just a improved attack speed. Interesting. Oh, and I didn't even read his talent. When attack and there's a 10% chance to trigger blood spear inflicting bleed on the target. If the target's already inflicted with bleed, the blood spear ignores 50% of their defense. So this sounds like the kind of hero where you don't want him to be the only bleed hero on the team and make sure you have another and you could really benefit from his talent ignoring defense. Sounds like there's some decent potential for damage here. And his other passive, when the target's HP is below 40%, increases the hero's damage by 10%. If the target is already inflicted with bleed, blood spear will inflict, inflict immobilize upon them for two seconds. Immobilize can be triggered up to one time every five seconds. So hero's unable to move. Again, another like, don't have him be the only bleed. Someone else places the bleed and then he helps to control him. I like it. I really like that. And then increases damage in the arena by 15%. So sounds pretty good, honestly. I mean, at least for some good range stuff, he is a marksman. So we actually have a marksman here, not just all these fighters and defenders. Uh, that's nice to see, but he's going to be very strong for Gear Raid 3. I could certainly imagine as well as like the anti-air arena, right? Sounds awesome. And you can tell like he is just, he's built to pair with a bleed team, which might be a little bit difficult, but hey, maybe that actually gives him some um, guild boss synergy as well i don't know it sounds like there's some great potential here if you're already having bleeds popping out and then his talent can ignore defense as well right his base stats are pretty low his attack is terrible his base hp is terrible oh gosh so he is super squishy and might be hard to actually get the damage on because his base attack is very low I don't, okay, maybe that takes away from him immediately seeing those base stats. His cost is really low, though, for sure. I guess some of the marksmen just might be a little bit lower with the attack, but I kind of expected to see higher base attack based on his kit sounding like he could smack. Maybe he doesn't quite do the damage we would hope. But let's take a quick look at his awakenings. During the effect Blood Shed Fury, the hero's HP is below 50%, additionally increases attack by 10%, and reduces defense by negative 10%. He's just a squishy little bastard, isn't he? <laughs> squishy little bastard. All right. Awakening three, when blood spear is triggered, if the HP, if the target's HP is higher than 80%, blood spear deals 80% extra damage. And then crit rate, and then awaken five, when any unit, including allies and enemies, is in range dies, uh, increases attack by 1%. Attack will be increased by additional 1% if the unit is killed by the hero and increased at a cap of 20. All right, we have Carnelian. So she also pairs with the cultist faction. Really, really interesting character. Really cool aesthetics again. Love it, love it, love it. All right, so after the hero's healing waves reach an ally without soul essence seven times, grant soul essence to them. And soul essence, when received fatal damage, the bearer consumes the Celescence and becomes unyielding for five seconds. So preventing fatal damage is awesome. Like that is very great for protecting the team. Let's read the rest of her kit here. We have uh, releases a, a healing wave to one ally in range and grants attack based healing 
to the target reached if their HP is below 30%. So she only heals if they're below 30%. Not the best for that heal. All right, her ultimate grants soul essence to all allies with HP below 30% in range and grants physical damage reduction and magic damage reduction to all allies in range. So this soul essence um, is definitely something that needs to be well-timed. You want to make sure you're timing her around other healers. Like, you don't want to go blast your Vortex or someone to heal everybody, and then you use her ultimate right after. You would really take, you would take away from the soul essence here, possibly protecting their death if there's some couple strong, hit coming, couple strong hits coming right after. So this is really cool. And not all of their kits are strange, but I think it's, it's definitely a complicated faction. That sounds like there's some really unique potential for team synergy. It just seems maybe it'll be a bit of a challenging faction to use overall. Uh, her passive, when a healing wave reaches an ally with soul essence, it will bounce up to another nearby enemy up to one time. However, its healing effect will decrease by 40% with each bounce. So again, doesn't sound like she's the best healer, but the possible um, pre preventing hero her allies from Fatal damage, adding the unyielding, that sounds like there's great potential. So we have soul vibration here as well. When a healing ally reach healing wave reaches an ally with soul essence, it deals 40% AoE damage up to, to up to seven enemies around the ally. So we've got actually a tiny bit of damage thrown in here with this healer. That's kind of nice to see. And then her cost for arena is reduced by five, so she's only 13 for cost. All right, another really interesting kit. So awaken one with 15 seconds after casting soul infusion when in any ally in range has their soul essence consumed, the duration of unyielding will be increased by one second. The healing effect of healing waves will no longer decrease with each bounce. And there's 20% chance that soul essence won't be consumed upon triggering. Interesting awakenings. Very interesting hero. Really curious to see how that would synergize. It does sound a bit complicated, but if you work with timings and things like uh, Gear Raid 2, how quirky is that, right? If this could probably really save some heroes in Gear Raid 2. Um, it just sounds complicated to do so, but hey, Gear Raid 2, working with timings and survivability is not easy anyway, so might as well. <laughs> So Durza here pairs with cultists, yet another one. I'm loving that, especially given that this faction is going to be really hard to summon for. It's going to be a really long time before most people have many heroes of this faction, so having synergies with the other is great. Basic attack applies slow, gains attack speed increase when attacking enemies inflicted with slow. All right. We want to see that for sure. Attack steal damage to one enemy. Simple as that. His ultimate deducts 40% of the current HP of allies in range and then starts a ritual that lasts for 10 seconds to provide allies in range with attack speed increase and deducts 20% of their current HP every two seconds. That sounds not ideal for most situations, am I right? Yeah, the sacrifice of everyone's HP to just have some more attack speed sounds quite risky. I mean,. I'm trying to think, like, where you'd really use that. Maybe it's just all about the synergy with this faction, but you'd have to have some really strong healing to keep everybody else alive. That does not sound ideal. Just to boost everyone's attack speed? I don't know. I don't know if I like this one. All right, Netherblood. During the Sanguine Rite, when the ally in range receives damage, there's a 20% chance to deal 90%. AoE damage to their nearby enemies and inflict vulnerability at the same time. Inflicting vulnerability is great. Definitely support hero. A support mage, but it's like, he's such a weird supportive mage. Like, he's a sacrificial one as well. He has some crowd control with the slow. He's a debuffer. I guess he's more of a debuffing mage that has a slight buff, but also a slight hindrance to allies. Yeah, I don't, I don't like him. I don't know. It sounds too, like too much for me. Uh, reduce cost in arena by four though so only 10 cost to place this mage so this is probably something that could be utilized well in arena specifically with his 
faction specifically, seeing that the rest of his faction really does uh, rely on low HP. So if you're just thinking about the faction itself and the fact that a lot of them do extra damage when their HP is lower, that's amazing. But in most content, or unless you have a full team focused around the chaos, you know, chaos dominion is the focus. I don't think he's going to be very strong. So he'd probably be one I hope I don't pull early on, at least until I have some others of the faction. Um, Awakening one here after the first HP redu deduction by Sanguine, right? If any allies HP falls below 30%, then their acquired attack uh, speed increase will last for 10 seconds more. Okay. Even more attack speed if they <laughs> lose a little bit too much HP. Great, great. <laughs> Awaken 3 during the effect of Sanguine Right deducts the HP of allies in range by 35% per second. Revival time minus. Oh, I like the revival time. All right. And then Awaken 5, which most people are never going to get <laughs> within 10 seconds after casting Sanguine Right. Basic attacks can hit two additional targets. Each basic attack can also deal 60% extra damage to targets hit one at time. All right. Very strange mage. I mean, of course, I'm sure there's great potential with just the right synergy, but that sounds very specific. It definitely sounds like a quirky arena meta thing with the right combination of heroes that are also part of this faction. And here is his stats. Not the best stats either, but the low attack kind of does show that maybe he's not the one really meant to do the damage. Uh, more enable the team or debuff the enemy doesn't surprise me. And we have Ardea. She's... I'm just gonna jiggle her. Sorry, not sorry. Okay, Northerner faction as well. Oh, I love it. And I love her. Look at these weapons. Okay, hey girl, hey. She's definitely a hey girl, hey, for many reasons. Um, let's continue. So she's a fighter with the range just like Velcra. And you guys know how much I love Velcra with that long range in front of her. So when performing a basic attack, there's a 25% chance that the hero will throw forward one circular blade instead while restoring 10, per 10 rage. The blade returns upon reaching the maximum distance of the basic attack. Enemies take 240% damage when hit by her blades for the first time. The hero will not perform basic attack until the thrown blade is retrieved. Okay, so she's got like blades like Theoin. <laughs> But she doesn't attack when her blades are thrown. She doesn't attack during those other times because those are her weapons and she got rid of them. That makes sense. Logic, right? All right. Her, phys her basic attack physical deals attacks up to seven targets at one time, dealing 100% damage. Her ultimate enter enters a frenzied state. Attack is increased by 30% and 15% of current HP is deducted per second. The hero throws two of her circular blades every time her talent effect is triggered. All right, passive unyielding courage. As the hero HP decreases, her talent trigger chance increases. This increase can go up to 30% when she reaches 30% HP. Additionally, each time she retrieves a released circular blade, her attack speed is increased by 50 for five seconds. This effect can be stacked up to two times. Sounds so interesting. She's definitely like all of them. They're all a bit quirky, but she sounds like she can be a monster. I love it. And we got lethal combo. When a hero deals damage to the same enemy two times within three seconds, her circular blade with her circular blade, she immediately deals 40% extra damage to them one time and inflicts bleed. Okay. Ooh. So when we're dealing with less enemies, like Guild Boss or something, she is going to pump out bleeds more often. That's really great to synergize with a lot of the other heroes we've already talked about. Let's take a look at her base stats. Ooh, okay. Almost 8,000 base attack. Hello. Hey, girl. Hey. Solid, solid HP and defense as well. Amazing base stats. All right. She might be my favorite. I'm very curious about her. And these blades look amazing. Absolutely love it. All right, Awakening. Oh, here we go. Now I know she's my favorite. This is one of my favorite debuffs in any game. When the hero deals damage with her circular blade, she inflicts defense reduction on the target. Okay, she is my goal for this faction. She's who I want. Can I get her in an Awakening 1, please? 
Attack three, all right, and then awaken three during the frenzied state. Killing an enemy increases the duration of state by one second, up to 10 seconds. All right, the, the duration of the frenzied state. Okay, oh my goodness, it's so interesting. These frenzy type low HP sacrificial heroes are so interesting. But yeah, it might be hard to use them in other areas of the game, but super, super fun. Waken 5 after the release, Circular Blade returns, immediately regenerates 15 rage. Oh, wow. Yeah, great. She sounds like such a badass. I really love it. But all right, let's quickly look at our epics as part of this faction. I'm not going to spend too much time there. So we have Atrox, a, a fighter. Another great look to their... I love their weapon design for some of these characters. Cannot be healed by allies. The revival time is greatly reduced. He just cannot be healed ever? Or only when his talent is triggered. Upon a revival, the revival time will increase by 6 seconds. And damage by 5%, stacking up to 3 times. So he is not one you want to put in front of Valkra because she can't revive him. <laughs> Activates Halo of Sacrifice ever after being deployed. Reduces HP by 1% per second. Deals 70% AoE damage per second to enemies around. Okay. Interesting. He's got a really low cost of only seven. Oh. After death generates a ground effect area, dealing 70% AoE damage per second. Airborne units take half the damage instead. So you, with this AoE, you might be able to get away putting him behind the wall in gear raid one. And reduce cost in arena by two. He's only cost five in arena. Oh my goodness. Okay, he's definitely interesting. Um, maybe gear raid 2 he could be used with a lot of the strat- So, because his cost is so low, and I think he could really be fun in gear raid 2 as well. To be able to be one of the people you plop in quick, to, t uh, to take one of the boulder damages even, or, in, uh, or the, someone you put in after someone takes some boulder damage, and then he actually fights to kill the enemy. Awaken 1 has even more decreased revival time. It sounds like you're just going to constantly be like letting him die, reviving him, letting him die, reviving him, or recalling him frequently. <laughs> Cost Awaken 3 there, and damage of ground effect area generated by lethal bonfires increased by 10%. Okay. Very interesting. And then we have Vargas. All right, so Vargas is um another... Epic to finally round out this faction. We have a marksman in the loop. I like it. Another marksman. So when de deployed, gains invisibility. Basic attacks change to two strikes in a row when attacked by targets with HP lower than 30%. He's got a cost of only 11 as well. Okay, not crazy base stats here, especially not that attack. But hey, doesn't mean that's all he's good for. So, oh, he's got, of course, prioritizing airborne units with his basic attack. Should be pretty darn good for gear raid, I guess. Um, gear raid 3, right? Consumes 50% of current HP and removes invisibility. Each attack deals 50% damage with bleeding targets. 25% extra damage. Ooh, okay, now there's more synergizing with bleed. That's nice to see. Upon killing enemies, increases attack by 15%, lasting for 10 seconds. This effect can be triggered one time every 25 seconds. And then uh, uh, arena damage increased by 15%. His awakenings, he when Zealous Fury is activated, restores 50 rage. Oh, nice. Solid. And then awaken 3. Hitting a bleeding target refreshes the duration of bleed effect on them. Oh, I like that. So they do really make it so the synergies are feel really strong with this faction. It's such a strange faction overall, but I think it sounds pretty darn good to me. It just doesn't seem like they're going to be the kind of heroes that are useful everywhere. Maybe some of them for guild boss, some of them for a few of the gear raids or artifact material raid. But for the most part, it's definitely an arena specialist one. And it definitely seems like people like this guy are really going to need the whole core of the faction to be strong. Although, luckily, a lot of the others pair with other factions so they can take advantage of Lord bonuses. But hope this video was helpful. It's a long one, but there's so much to talk about. 
It was really fun though, so hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.